This presentation is provided by BoardPack LLC for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. The opinions expressed by the presenters are their own and not necessarily those of BoardPack. On behalf of BoardPack, we welcome you to today's webinar. BoardPack has teamed up with Amazon's number one best-selling author in board governance, Thomas Bakewell, and fundraising guru, Carol Wiseman, to help educate boards on the latest industry trends. The Boardroom webinar series will focus on different topics each month. I wanted to mention really quickly that BoardPack is a secure, affordable, and easy-to-use paperless board meeting solution. Users can access materials from the native iPad app or through a web browser on other devices. Private annotations, minutes builder, and unlimited document storage are a few highlights of what we have to offer. Before we jump into today's topic, let me tell you a little bit about today's speakers. Thomas Bakewell works to bring out the best your team has to offer. He is the author of the book, Claiming Your Place at the Boardroom Table. Over the past 30 years, Thomas Bakewell has advised and directed CEOs and presidents of large for-profit and nonprofit corporations. His vast board experience has made him a leader and go-to source in board governance. Carol Wiseman, president of Board Builders, is an internationally known speaker, author, trainer, and consultant. Carol specializes in volunteerism, fundraising, and governance. Carol won a Telly Award for her PBS special, Building a Board with a Passion for Mission. Her board experience is vast, having served on 38 boards and served as president of seven. Carol and Tom, take it away. So, what we're going to be dealing with today is whether board members have a sell-by date. What do you mean by a sell-by <laughs> sell date? I can't even say it. What do you mean by a sell-by date? Well, how long should board members serve and should they have term limits and what are the trends we're seeing? So that's what we're going to talk about today, Great topic Tom. and some great questions. So let's talk about the four most common policies um, on term limits. Well, I see you have a nice list here. So you talk about unlimited term service. So there's a lot of boards where people spend an unlimited time that, as long as they want to. What kind of board would that be? What's an example? Well, you and I worked with a board a number of years ago where at the 50th anniversary of the organization, five of the founders were still on the board. One was in a nursing home and one had passed away. Yeah. That is a long term. <laughs> Uh, obviously a very devoted group. Absolutely. Sure, and then you have a cap based on age, so uh, so you're basically saying there's age limits. I think this is really more in the for-profit world. What do you think? Okay. Well, you do have uh, age limits. I don't see it too often in the not-for-profit world, uh, but uh, there are, in fact, age limits in a number of uh, public company boards, although, interestingly, that trend seems to be changing, too, so that people are moving away from age limits. Well, and the other age limits are how young you can be, and that's state by state. So some states it's 18, some it's 21. So there are limits on both sides. Good observation that people uh, often don't think about. And in fact, back to the for-profit world, there's also uh, in the uh, public company space, there's quite a trend to have very young board members. You yes. have some of the, some of the well-known boards like a Starbucks or a Google where they have people in their uh, early 30s uh, joining boards now quite successfully. I have a mentor who is on a board now of a publicly held insurance company is 23. He or she? She's on, in, a medical student. And she's a mentor. Are you a mentee or a mentor? Yes, no, uh, both. She's te teaching you about technology or what? Right, and I'm teaching her about professional speaking. So All right, <laughs> off we go. Great. So, uh, and then a cap based on years of service, what does that look like? Uh, that's when, and it's most frequently um, three, six, eight years, mm -hmm. eight, we, you and I have found, or nine, three terms of three years mm -hmm. is what we're seeing in the nonprofit sector. Good. And how about a term based on results of a regular performance review? Whether you basically stand until you're thrown off, or what's that mean? No, what it means is uh, you have to produce a certain amount of work, mm -hmm. and if you don't do it, there's regular, and that's what we're going to be talking about next month, is board evaluation. Very good. And best practices is one of those categories. Good. So let's talk about the trends in for-profit companies. And again, here we primarily are talking about, as it says, they're public companies. Um, there's definitely a trend towards, uh, I'll take this one, Carol, there's definitely a trend towards shorter terms. 
Uh, they're moving away from what we were talking about, classified boards. That's where you uh, have a class of, uh, let's say you got a board with uh, nine people and you have three-year uh, three, three -year groups. So every year you would uh, elect a group for three years. Um, and that's uh, some legal machinations there. It's a technical term, machinations. <laughs> where what you're doing is uh, the uh, argument against it is that it's kind of a power block. If you've got somebody who's not performing or they want to take over a company, there wants to be a hostile or even a friendly takeover of a company, uh, it's hard to move a board of directors out. So um, uh, many of the public companies are actually moving towards annual elections. That's really the big trend. And again, this has to do with what's called activist investors or outside investors saying, we're done and we're tired with uh, having uh, board members who are non-performing. So again, it really gets back to the issue of performance. And one way to de uh, deal with that is to have every uh, director up for election every year versus what we've seen for many, many years with uh, public company boards is people who go on and never retire. It's a pretty good gig if you can get it. About half the boards are using age caps, and again, the age limit is being extended. Uh, has been, if, if they have age limits, it's been 72, it's up to 75 now. And the reality is people are living longer, a lot of people are more vital, uh, and uh, board work is a, a game where um, there can be heavy lifting intellectually, but doesn't tend to be too physically demanding, so people can do it. And then 30% of the public company boards require resignation upon change of professional status. Let's talk about that for a second. There's a footnote there. What's that mean to you? In practice, resignation is submitted and is seldom accepted. What that means is they have nonfiction. They have fictional bylaws, not non, not for, not fiction. Okay, so be, to this. be precise here, uh, there's a policy that says if a board member leaves their, company. their job or leaves their company or maybe even has a little bit of a uh, scandal or something, they're required to submit their uh, resignation, but many times uh, the company simply does not accept it. That and also sometimes they don't submit it. Mm -hmm. and the, the question is whether to push it. Uh, and I think some people think it's kicking someone when they're down yeah. because they really use that board to get their next position. Yeah. I had a, a friend of mine who was a, a very wonderful uh, theologian, and he had an unusual situation. He was on a public company board, and he got the job because the public company dealt in that space. They dealt in higher education. Mm -hmm. They dealt with theology. And he just presumed he was always going to have that job. And he took another job. And I know for a fact this fellow was really counting on that good fee for his college education for his children. And he was a little surprised when he didn't get invited back into the game or actually got invited off the island. Yeah. Thought there was other stuff going on there too, but uh, he was being a little... Um, complacent. A little naive yeah. and a little complacent. Yeah. Let's uh, fly on here. We've had a long time on that one. Tell me about the trends in not-for-profits. That's your sweet spot. Yes. And, and actually, it's quite different in some ways and similar in others. Um, for some board members, um, board leadership is not a lifetime commitment. And with some of them, it really is. And we're going to talk about some of those people as well. 71% uh, of all nonprofits now have term limits, and many organizations have consecutive terms. And what I'm finding most common is it's a three-year term, and most common is two years, although some have three years, and then a year off, and sometimes they can come back. Um, and again, 63% have three-year terms. And a number of boards, if you've got a high performer, they don't want to lose them. And that's smart. Why should you? Exactly, and we're going to talk about how to retain those people, sure. keep them involved, even with the term limits. Yeah. So before you move on there, I don't know, let's keep the slide just where it is. And the question is, uh, on not-for-profit trends, I just want to ask you a practical question. How do you renew the energy and keep the energy going in a not-for-profit board? I mean, you're not being paid many times. If you're paid anything, it's covering your expenses. Uh, a lot of times there's a lot of work with fundraising, a lot of times. How do you keep the energy up? Do you just, again, look at the individual to see if they're passionate about it and doing good work or, or what? Well, the external forces frequently are something either excites and energizes a board member, such as the Ice Bucket Challenge. Mm -hmm. Just worked with ALS. 
the ice bucket challenge, I mean, these people are on fire. They're ready to go because they've got some capital to work with and they're gonna get closer to a cure. Mm -hmm. So everybody's on fire. Mm -hmm. Some people, when there's a big need and they start a capital campaign, some of your board members will perk up like little flowers and some will wilt. And head to the doors. <laughs> Absolutely. And you have to be able to give people the opportunity to chair the campaign or walk out the door. So uh, what I hear you saying, if I can interpret a little bit, um, service and term limits with not-for-profits especially is not just about uh, the bylaws and what it says. It's really about the level of interest, the level of performance, and what people like to do. Absolutely. Yep. And where yep. the organization's going. Good. Very good. So we've got more oh. trends. I want to jump back one more on this slide here to talk about private companies. So we've got, uh, let me let you look at this for a second and ask a question or two. What do you see there, Carol, about private companies? Well, again, it's owners pick the directors. So some of them do a great job and some of them have an FOB kind of way of doing things so it's friends of Bob's or Barber's mm -hmm. and you get all people right. with the same skill set and some people really do a fabulous job of picking their advisors yeah so you have a situation basically in a private company where oftentimes you have a closely held ownership and the owners like to have advisors around or they may say we have a board but they may not have an official board it may be an advisory board it may not be a statutory board and even if it's a statutory board, if there's a close level of ownership, the owners can always move out uh, the directors if they choose to. So, so you get a little uh, bit uh, less attention to um, uh, term limits at all. So here on the next one, you say not-for-profits and founders. So you're talking about the founder game with not-for-profits. Absolutely. What, what's, what's on your mind with that? Well, the first group really is that FOB, the Friends of Barbara mm -hmm. or Bob, right. and they bring their friends together, people like-minded who share the same values, want to solve the same problem, right. fill the same niche. And because they put so much of their heart and soul frequently founded in their mm -hmm. kitchen or in their right. dining room or in their office, after six years, they don't want to be kicked off the island as you yeah. say. Yeah, and so let me just throw a name or two here, not to uh, pick on anybody. In fact, uh, these are all fine organizations, but so um, you also get what's called the fan, uh, uh, the founder syndrome, yes. not, uh, not only with the directors, but also the issue of the founder themselves. So I'm recalling a, a organization known as Focus on the Family had a founder, Jim Dobson, and went through you know um, a, a um, uh, closely watched transition. It took a long time. It's been pretty successful, but it's always hard for that uh, leader to transition. Another name that comes to mind, again, from the faith-based space uh, is uh, Oral Roberts University. They had some transition issues and some ups and downs, as many organizations do, but they've landed pretty well. But so you have the issue of almost term limits for owners. Well, if you're the founder or the owner, yeah. you can pretty well make your term limit what you want. Yes? Yes. And Here's the problem. Uh, once it becomes more formalized and the community truly owns your organization, right. you can get fired. And that's what happened with the founder of Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Oh, I don't know that here. She yeah, was, uh, she was a, a terrific organization. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah, so the founder, what happened? The board fired her. Oh, good. And so they thought she wasn't the right person to lead anymore. Yeah, that makes me think of a lot of private companies where they get into the same issue where somebody founds a company and has a fabulous idea, but when it comes time to sell the company or to grow it or develop it or to bring outside investors in, a lot of times the skill sets of that entrepreneurial founder is different. So, so what do we have on the next slide here? Reasons to have term limits. So let's talk about that. There's some really good reasons, and one of them is um and we're on to the next one um is mission fatigue yeah. for those of you who are listening we have two beautiful young women who sit by our side and move these slides so um we we're not even doing it ourselves we're so lazy but mission fatigue is more common in the nonprofit sector. And I think when you deal with some of the really devastating social issues, I see this more with things like domestic violence, uh, child abuse, uh, human trafficking, where the, the depth of the 
problem is so overwhelming that people do get fatigued. Yeah. So uh, you, you, there are uh, tough things going on in the world, and there's uh, uh, you know good, terrific people that are committed to it. But if you're dealing with a cancer-oriented charity, yeah. or you're dealing with um, you know uh, world relief organizations, um, but it, it can be over overwhelming. Interestingly enough, it can also happen with an opera company mm -hmm. that's not making any traction. Right. If you're not moving forward, it really becomes, and you've got a great product, you believe, whether it's opera or ballet or whatever, mm -hmm. and you can't produce the shows that you want to, yeah. you eventually just burn out. Yeah, and that you, you just described what I uh, can recall many times is the worst challenges that I face in my consulting is the organization, it's a good organization, they were vital and thriving once upon a time, but they've become tradition bound and they just don't have the energy or the excitement or the leadership they need. You know, they're just kind of stuck in the mud. So, well, and you've got the same thing in the for profit sector mm -hmm. when it comes to looking at new audiences. Yep. And that can be a problem. Go ahead. It does. Let me talk about this issue of mission fatigue from another angle. Though. Let's, a lot of people ha just ask the hardball question. Okay, question. here's the question, Carol. You're at a cocktail party and somebody says, look, which is best? Is it best to have term limits or not to have term limits? I've got a not-for-profit and uh, it's good to see people come in, but inevitably after five or ten years, shouldn't they share the wealth? Shouldn't they let other people come on the board? Uh, or uh, what? Uh, oh, oh, you know, I've seen time and time again in not-for-profits where the same group comes in, they kind of get locked in, and they, uh, after five or ten years, they just kind of get tired of doing the heavy lifting, and the organization goes sideways. Versus the other side of that, look, there are people that can have a, a love for and passion for an organization for 25 or 30 years. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? What do you say to them? I'm going to answer like a lawyer. Okay. I'm going to say it depends. Yeah, it depends. And what it depends on, and this is really about rigor, is are you regularly evaluating the work of the board? And if you are regularly evaluating the work of the board, which is incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult, and that's why we're going to spend some time talking about it next in our next session, then you don't need term limits, yeah. but very few people do a good job at that. So I, uh, you know, being the lawyer, that was a shot, folks. At uh, yeah, the, right, uh, from my friend <laughs> across the table. Me, but that's quite all right. Uh, I will tell some consultant jokes later. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, um, it depends uh, on term limits. And what you need to do is have a theory and practice about what you want to do, and do have good board practices and evaluation practices. I can think of boards where they actively turn people over and it works very well, and I can think of boards where they don't actively turn people over, but they evaluate them very carefully. So it's what works for you, and but you need to strategically think about it. The last comment I'll make is that I've been on boards in the past where I've taken myself off the board. I had one board that I was terribly passionate about and was on for 15 years, a college board. And at the end of 15 years, I was at a different place in life. Sure. My skill set wasn't what they needed so much anymore, although they saw it differently. I had young kids. I was traveling a lot. I couldn't be, and a lot of people uh, that had the attitude, well, it's fine. Just stay on the board and just don't participate so much. And, and I'm kind of an all-in kind of person, so that wasn't going to work for me. So. And I, I had the opposite yeah. situation, was which, which was my kids were young. Yep. They were involved. I was on a board that was the Gifted Resource Council, which I loved. My kids were in this program. And then my kids grew up. And six years later, I wanted to go on and do something else. Right. And they just assumed I would stay on for mm -hmm. 10 or 20 yeah. years. And I said, my kids aren't in your program. Yeah. But you know their program. And I said, it's it's time for me to move on. Yeah. These kids are getting long in the tooth. Yeah, absolutely. And, and those, are, that's a, those are good examples. In fact, the example you give I'm facing right now, I've been uh, an advisory board for a school, and my kids are out of the school yeah. now. They're in their last year, and, and suddenly I don't feel the same love. Sure. So, yeah, good. Okay. What's this about fundraising? Well, here's the fantasy, and it may or may not be true, and I don't have any data on this, but the fantasy is that you'll increase fundraising opportunities if you have term limits because you'll bring more people in. Oh, I, I, can, I can see some holes in that, but you tell me what, what they are. Well, the idea is that you've squeezed every drop out of the current board members and you've worked their mm -hmm. affiliates <laughs> and their friends and, and their sphere of influence, and so bring other people in. 
And sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. But this really has to do with training and expectations. Now, what about your second comment here about influence uh, and connections for sales and not for profit? So is that the directors and trustees bring relationships that help? A absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you run an organization in a slightly different sphere and a for-profit corporation is moving into that sphere, mm -hmm. it's wonderful uh, to have a new board member who can bring people to the table, bring business contacts, and influence the sales process. Very good. And so talk a little bit about uh, bringing in new talents and strategies. Um, so you're talking about people who can simply come into the board and energize it with new ideas, and that's one of the reasons to turn over a board or to expand a board? Yes, yeah. uh, and people get very parochial. They've been doing things. That, when you start to hear things like, we tried that in 1964 mm -hmm. and it didn't yeah. work. Yeah. You know, you've got a problem. Yeah. And it's very frustrating sometimes when new people come in, but sometimes they have the energy. I was on a board that owned some land out of the United States that was appraised at $1.6 million, although we had appraisals from 600000 to $7 million, so it was wonky. And it had been left to this organization, and every new board member would come in and say, we really should sell that land. Yeah. And we'd all go, yeah, we never thought of that. Uh -huh. And we couldn't get anybody to represent us because of the people who happened to be on the land who had machetes. Yes. And you know, realtors are, your wife is a, a yep. fabulous realtor. Uh, she may have an aversion to getting chopped up. People uh -huh. are funny about that. And so every time a new board <laughs> member would come in, they'd say, you know, you should really think about selling this land. and it would aggravate some people, and I would say, don't be aggravated, sick them on this problem, uh. and say, oh, I have a, and they'd say, oh, I have a friend at Century 21, it's an international company, sure. or Sotheby's, or whatever, let me see what I can do, and we'd go, go with God, make it happen, and this was, I started this 10 years ago, the land still hasn't been I was been just going to say, has, it ever, has anybody <laughs> ever gotten had, the deal done? And, and when you say it's indigenous tribes, so it's obviously another country? Or is yes, this it's in, another in, country. In, or is this uh, some no, no, local town? No, 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 no. <laughs> this, is, this is out of the United States. And, um, you know, it's really yeah. hard to sell land when you've got people with machetes, no matter what it's worth. I can get that picture. That That's a, a, a shocking uh, example, but a real one. So you got a great picture here of a board meeting where um, uh, people don't seem to be uh, focusing maybe on their board work. I see way too many phones and computers out and all. And what's this about removing a board member? What's what's up with that? Well, basically, and I don't agree with this, but a lot of people say, well, you know, we have term limits. Mm -hmm. And I think if somebody's underperforming right. and your mission is important, right, then waiting a year or two is not good enough. It's a bad idea. Yeah, so it's a every, bad idea. No matter what approach you have, the term limits, you really believe in. Now, how would you do this? Would you officially have an, an evaluation? Would you coach the, the member before you move to uh, uh, talk to them? How would you do that? And just for the record, my experience of my many, many years is probably the same as yours. The last thing in the world people want to do is, is deal with a problem oh, board yeah. member. And my philosophy on this one is praise in public and discuss difficult behavior in private. Right. And sometimes people don't even know their behavior is really disruptive. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I worked with a board and there was this fabulous board member who had just retired and he had nothing to do. So he would come to the board meeting and his misbehavior wasn't obnoxious. He just would make jokes and he would go on and on. And people had to get back to work. He had more time than anybody else. So uh, what should have taken 20 or 30 minutes or an hour, it was taking all, all morning because he had time on his hands. Exactly. Yeah. And what we did, the board chair should have dealt with this. Mm -hmm. And he didn't. And in fact, that's the reality. A, yes. a great board chair makes the difference in every way because they can quietly tell somebody uh, to, uh, in, a, in, a, in a pleasant conversation or not a firm conversation that there's an issue here and we need to attend to it. And basically what happened is I got a call from the executive director. We did a meeting evaluation and he said, is this just bothering me? And so we did a meeting evaluation. It was bothering a lot of people. Yeah. We came up with a creative solution. We said to this gentleman, would you be willing to take notes about all your great ideas during the meeting 
and meet with the executive director for lunch every mm -hmm. Thursday right. after the board meeting and debrief when you both have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I'd be glad to advise him. So how did the executive director deal with that? Is he that, was glad was to that, be, okay. because he so valued this he guy. He valued the person. Yeah, and, Excellent. and he sort of understood that this was a difficult transition not right. working anymore. Right. So it worked pretty well. Well, this is the reality of moving folks out. Uh, it's it's the unpleasant part that people seldom talk about removing uh, unperforming uh, or non-performing uh, board members. So you got a cute picture here in yeah. terms of uh, an increasing age diversity. And uh, let me read what it says here in this slide. I want some young people on this board so I can learn to use our board portal. What is a board portal? A board portal. Um, it, they're on ships. And... <laughs> Uh, it's Come on a, now. a fabulous tool yeah. uh, that BoardPAC right. uh, is the leader in the industry. But in fact, for a lot of people, it's very difficult to transition to even doing something as simple as typing. Right. And, and I'm going to pick on you again, Tom, and I apologize, but it's not that you're in this age group, but men over 50 frequently have not had typing lessons. Right. And many women over 50 have. And so... The guys don't know how to type or they touch type and don't do it well. And my wonderful husband is one of these guys. And so learning how to use new technology is really important. And we rely on the younger board members. Yeah, and, I, and just the practical reality is I'm, uh, you know, I, like you, on a regular basis deal with a lot of boards. And, and I consistently, it's not so much anymore, but I still see boards uh, pretty regularly where there's one or two people where... Everybody else is on uh, the um, you know electronic site, the board portal, and there's one or two people still having everything FedEx to them and all, and, and um, uh, or overnighted to them. So uh, it's a challenge. Uh, but what about the issue of increasing age diversity? Um, tell me about that. I think it's so important because we're now in a paper or plastic world, in a, in the sense that grocery stores wanted to get rid of paper and mm -hmm. moved only to plastic. And there was such a hue and cry that you had to have both. And so whatever you do has to be available on multiple platforms. And those of us who are over 50 are not as comfortable with other platforms as people who are under 50. Mm -hmm. And so you have to know how to communicate with a large audience. So it's pretty practical uh, reality that um, um, good boards t are, are getting um, much more diverse in their age and there's good reasons for that. Absolutely, yeah. and I think that's really exciting. What about this actions to take if you do have term limits? So many, many organizations do have term limits. Term limits are, you can almost argue they're neutral. You can have them or not. Um, you know, six of one, half dozen the other. A lot of people have uh, various reasons. I've seen people use term limits in very creative ways to, uh, you know, for example, deal with a board that really has aged out together. Yes. And then what are we going to do? Because we, we acknowledge it. We know we need to do it. But everybody on the board is thinking, what? Well, Everybody but me, but no, yes. that's not always the case. So, so what do you do? How do you make good use of term limits when you have them? Well, I think one of the essential practices in the for-profit world that's not done in the nonprofit world is the exit interview. And probably the best one I ever did was with a board member of a board that I had been on, and I'd been on for about three years. He'd been on for about 15. He'd given a million dollars a few years back it was a total bust. They were going to buy a building. He gave them a million dollars, and it turned out to actually convert the building into what it needed to be it was going to be five million. Yikes. And it was sort of a toxic waste dump. And so they got rid of the building, and his one million dollars went down the drain. Basically evaporated. It was a mess. And so he said, I think it's time to leave. The fact that he had stayed for a while was amazing. And so. I sat down with him as a board member and the executive director, and we said to them, him, if we could only call you one time in the next year, what should we call you about? And he came up with something we had no idea he was interested in. He was a physician who had a family foundation, and he said, I'm extremely interested in architecture. And so if you do buy a building, I'd like to be involved in the search committee. And I was astounded after his $1 million had gone down the drain. And he said, this was, I think it was like September, October, our board terms. And I, he, I said, 
when would be a good time to call you? And he, he, oh, he, I didn't say that. He said to me, don't, don't call me before the holidays because I have a lot of family coming in. And then he said, on the other hand, I may want to go to a few meetings during the holidays. Sure. And he stayed actively involved only with this issue. All because of a simple uh, question and a simple process of having good exit interviews. So very important. Who do you suggest that does this? Is it just somebody you say they're uh, a staff person or a board member? Both. Uh, ideally, at the same time, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, together, uh, a board chair. Who do you who do you really like? What, what have you seen? Uh, just the person with the... Greatest intellect, the most capital in the organization, you know, most standing, what? I like to have a board member and a staff person. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like to have the two is for institutional memory. Because, again, okay. if we have term limits, I may be gone in three years and forget that this guy who had given a million dollars, who loved the organization, who stayed on when his money had been right. badly spent, said that he would be interested in a new building and helping with it. Neat, neat insight. So let's look at some of these other questions you would ask in the exit interview. What do you? What did you like about your board service? And obviously the next one's going to be, what did you not like? What's uh, what's an a, a example or two of uh, kind of maybe not shocking but interesting things you've learned from these types of interviews in the past? Well, I, I remember talking to an orthopedic surgeon who was very, very bright guy. And he said, you know, I didn't really understand what this organization did for my first two years. And I'm thinking, holy cow, we need a better orientation. A whole program. lot better orientation. Oh, yeah. Because yes. this, this was a guy who really cared. He was really bright. This was a complex organization with 23 mission foci, mm -hmm. which is a lot. Yeah. And he didn't understand how the organization worked. Okay. So that was, that was a big heads up. And what's the biggest wake up call you've heard on something somebody didn't like? Oh, I think it was when I heard, and I had this feeling and I thought it was just me. He said, when the development director, our development director calls, I cringe. Mm -hmm. I.e. the fundraiser. So they, they, yeah, fun, they did. A fundraiser with a personality problem yes. or something. Yes. Mm -hmm. She yeah. was very strident and yeah. she was kind of a bully. Yeah. Yeah, I've got that right now. I won't give you the details other than to say I'm working with an organization where they have a, a key fundraiser who has remarkable intellect but doesn't like people. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just like, oh, can you make that work? And, you know, a lot of people are trying to persuade me that you can, but I'm kind of like saying, well, not if you expect them to go ask for money. So. Well, and let's face it, as much as we'd like it, board members are not ATMs. Yeah. You have to yeah. interact with them. <laughs> so, and then the other thing is, yeah, what, what are you doing well? How about yeah. that? What are you doing well as an organization? It's always good to get that feedback, and sometimes the simplest feedback can be the most profound or just an encouragement to the team to know what we're doing well. And also being able to get back to the staff and mm -hmm. getting permission. Right. So I remember I was doing one exit interview and the guy said, you know what, Carol? I love so-and-so who answered the phone. She is always cheerful. Yep. And I know she has a really sick child. Right. And I just think she's valiant. And I said, may I share that with her? And I called her up, and she was her usual, wonderful, cheerful self. She had a kid with a very bad asthma and was frequently taking her to the ER and on and on and on. And I said, I, I just want you to know how much I appreciate mm -hmm. you, but also so-and-so who's leaving the board said, you were one of the best mm -hmm. parts of being involved with this organization because of your positive attitude. It's great to be noticed. It's great to be appreciated. And um, speaking of appreciation, I'm moving to this next slide. And one of the things I appreciate is about your uh, uh, insights and humor. And there's a quote here that I've taken from you many, many times <laughs> over the years in just the right setting. And I guess it's talking about moving board members out. What does this mean? Do not just whack and plaque. We're not talking about plaque on the teeth here. We're, yeah, we're right. talking about a nice little uh, honorary commemorative plaque you give somebody so don't just whack them and don't just, just whack, whack them and plaque. And plaque. <laughs> i can't even say it you're long-term board members what is this about well you really have to celebrate board service and especially your superstars yep. and asking them if they can be honored mm -hmm. and i'll give you a great example this was an amazing experience i had a number of years ago i was on a plane and got bumped up to first class, which really is Americans uh, amazing since you and I both fly Southwest all the time now. But 
uh, an older gentleman came in and he was on two canes and he sat down next to me and I pulled out my, I was going from St. Louis to DC and I was, pulled out my board source program and he said, oh, are you going to board source? And I said, yes. And he said, I am too. And I thought, obviously he's just trying to pick me up. Of course. But, <laughs> but what he said was, I'm on a board in East St. Louis and it's the orphanage I grew up in. And I said, really, tell me about it. And he said, I've got Parkinson's, and I want to find out how to do this really well. Oh, neat. And he said to me the most amazing thing. He said, what I've done now, because I really want to stay on the board, is I've written my resignation letter. Mm -hmm. And one of my best friends from the orphanage, who also has been very successful, we've been very blessed, has my resignation letter. And when he decides I'm not doing a good enough job, I've already funded it. There'll be a big party, and they'll say goodbye to me. So he makes the call when they have the party. His friend does. Yes, his friend. Good. Yeah. Interesting and so, concept. Okay. Um, now let me ask you the flip side of this, back to the issue of a problem board member. Are there times to whack and plaque somebody when they're really not performing? Uh, oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You know, the thing about... Nonprofit boards, many for-profit boards, you get paid. Right. But if you work for UPS and you're getting a nice salary and the guy you work with is a jerk, if you are not willing to put up with him, you don't pay your mortgage, you don't eat, you got big problems. If you're on a board and you don't like the person on the board, you'll you quietly can, go away or what? Yeah. yeah. You, you or just, maybe not people so stop coming. Yeah, people stop coming. And yeah. that's really a big problem because you can still pay your mortgage, you can still eat regularly, and there's no consequences. And so it's a big problem if you've got a disruptive board member. So you really have to watch the group dynamics. Absolutely. And, uh, it's, it's a big part of, even though you can have the legal aspects of term limits, you got to look at how do you get a board to work really well together. And personalities is a big part of that. Okay. So what about creative ways of using the talent and wisdom of long-term board members or long-time board members, people who've been on a very, very long time? Well, I'll give you an example. One of my clients, ALS, just adopted term limits. Right. And I was working with one of their chapters. And they're just a dynamic, wonderful organization. And now they have term limits. And so I was talking to one of the um, gentlemen who was on the board. And he said, Carol, I'm going to get kicked off this board. And he felt he was going to get kicked to the curb. And I said, well... Was there some reason he was so passionate about it? Absolutely. And I said, what is the big problem? What is your big concern about term limits? And he said, my father, my brother, and my son have had ALS. Oh, my. And he said, I don't care about anything else. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go on the board of the Humane Society or the Opera or any place else. This is who I am. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. and this is what I'm passionate about. And I said, well, what do you do really well? And he said, well, you may not believe this, but I'm really a good fundraiser. I like it. I like asking mm -hmm. for money. I've spent my whole life in sales. And he's got a story to tell, too. Absolutely. And a passion. Yeah. And I said, would you be willing to chair the fundraising committee next year. Even though he's not a board member. Absolutely no, no problem. Absolutely. And he didn't know. So he can be on a committee, as it says here. Uh, he could be on a committee. He can chair uh, the committee. He can chair the committee. Absolutely. And what happened was, he's going to do that in a year. Yeah. And chair that committee. And his plan is to go back on the board. Because yeah. that's in the bylaws. Yeah. He can serve another nine years. There you go. So a key insight, and you just talked about two key insights there. One is... Um, uh, and by the way, it's a, it's a back to splitting the baby. Do you have term limits or do you have not? My sure. preferred answer to that always, if people push, is to say, well, I do believe in term limits, and and then have a gap just like you're describing, uh, so that if you've got a non-performer, they get eased off the board. Although again, we should look at getting people off if they're not performing. But if you can always take the hiatus, and you always can invite your rock stars back on. But this is another great solution. I've worked with boards like you have. Uh, one in particular was a major, major uh, uh, healthcare worldwide organization. And they had a board that was enormously large and they needed to compress the size uh, just for control and, and you know some uh, legal reasons. But the reality is this board was raising hundreds of millions of dollars a year. As they say, it was the players in town and people were terrified about moving those people off. And when they had the confidential and the honest conversation, what they learned was 
they would be happy to be whacked and plaqued or they'd be happy to come once or twice a year or sure. do what they love doing, but they didn't really need to come to all the meetings or get all the documents or deal with all the board portals every day. They had a different time in life and they were looking at doing other things. So what other, uh, can you be on a task force, a leadership council, advisory board? What are those? Talk about that. Absolutely. And so there's all kinds of other places. And this is true all during your board uh, time is that it may be um, better to be on just a committee if yep. you don't really want to eat the whole board enchilada. Gotcha. So there's all kinds of ways to slice this. So let's talk about uh, the flip side of this, perhaps. Well, are there reasons not to have a term limits? Oh, absolutely. What are some of those? Well, let's start with institutional memory. Yeah, okay. And what happens is people really know people's story, the story of the organization. And when you have, let's say you have a board of mm -hmm. 18, which is more common in the nonprofit sector mm -hmm. than in the for-profit sector, and within, you, you lose six people. Mm -hmm. You, you've lost a lot of memory of what happened, who so was involved. So turnover. Turnover can uh, make a change. So well, and be, again, this is actually a reason to have a board portal because so, especially since we've changed platforms, some people, the, the history was stored in their Apple IIe. Yeah. And it can be on a floppy or who knows what. I, I want to emphasize this point just that you're making. They're one of the great, great uh, techniques or tools of keeping great board minutes and having a board, one of the great values of having a board portal, uh, particularly a, you know, a highly effective one like a board pack here, is the reality that you can keep minutes for a prolonged period of times. You can do searches by topic. So if we're gonna talk again about that piece of land in some faraway sure. country that's gonna be sold, we can pull it up and say, hey, we've talked about this in 2000, 2003, 2007, <laughs> right. 2008. Would you like to see the minutes? Otherwise, can we move on? Yes, yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Okay. What else? What are some of the other benefits of, uh, you know... Uh, of keeping people around? Yep, absolutely. People tend to make decisions about their estates when they have children, initially, and then they tend to update them again when their kids are gone and maybe they have grandchildren. And the third time I do it, speaking as lawyers, when they're going out of the country. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> on a vacation. Right. And so... Fundraising, especially uh, planned giving, is an incredible opportunity for boards, and that's where I'm seeing the greatest growth. Did you know, Tom, that dead people give more than corporations in the oh, United sure. States? Oh, no, sure. No, I mean, the <laughs> lo by, by a long shot, the yep. amount of giving is, is basically from estates, is it not? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and so as you have someone like this gentleman I was talking about before who has this horrible family history of ALS, um, he's, he's got ALS in his will. So what about mission as life's work? What do you have in mind there, in terms of term limits particularly? Well, again, if you really care about the opera or whatever it is. ALS, as you gave the great story. ALS. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've also met people who be, couldn't become an opera singer but loved the yes. opera. That's just their passion. And to pull them out doesn't make sense. Also, I loved one of my... Um, clients was also on the board of a Ronald McDonald house and he was so cute he said I don't believe in term limits and he said you know I bring in between one and two million a year because I love fundraising and they just keep me around well, and I thought wow that's surprising you don't, you don't, you don't <laughs> want a term limit on him no, that's right. no, you no. don't want to term him out for any reason so it's about having passion in your work what about the strategies uh, for evaluating your trustees if you don't have term limits? Well, number one, shows up. Okay. Um, Do they come? Yeah. Our, I, I was on a board where I had been on for three years and had never met one of the board members. She had never been there. Yeah, and that, and that's the totally wrong oh. reason. And unless you happen to know they're one of those people giving a million or two a year. Or they have some compelling reason, you know, some hook into the community or some, they may be the best uh, friend of the biggest donor or something. Well, and you know, if she had been giving a million or right. two a year, which she wasn't giving dime one, but had she been, that's called a yeah. donor, not a board member. Yeah, and that's, that's what you have to be clear about. So let's go around the circle. Showing up, they contribute. What else? Uh, they support staff. Right. Uh, they 
completes committee work. Yeah. If you say you're going to do it, do are it. you good to yeah. your word? And are you willing to share your sphere of influence? Yeah, so whatever criteria you come up with, it, it, on the front end you determine if we're going to have a board member, this is what we're looking for. Do you need to have the same criteria for every board member, or can it be different for different board members? I think to some degree there are board members that are limited. Right. Um, and sometimes public officials, mm -hmm. um, the a lot of judges cannot fundraise. Right. And so they can share their sphere of influence, but they may not be able to make the ask. Mm -hmm. So you have to be flexible. So you have to have a plan about what you're looking for, what slots you have, and how you want to f uh, fill them. And and if if there are skill sets that you, you have, how to evaluate them, et cetera, okay? Exactly. And so what's this, ask the question yearly, what question is that? Is this a good time for you to continue to serve? Oh, ask every board member Absolutely. this question. Absolutely. And there may be a number of reasons. If you've signed on for three years, just think about where you and I were three sure. years ago. Um, my kids weren't back in St. Louis. Your kids were in high school. And so it was a very different world. And for many people, three years is a very long time. Right. We could have changed jobs, sure. um, could have a sick relative, any number of things, or, or a big right. job change. Where you don't have, where you all of a sudden you're traveling. All right, let me ask you a hardball question here or two before we kind of move to a wrap. So on this particular question, what if you're sitting there with a board where you're afraid to ask this question because you might lose people and you're desperate not to lose them? You need a recruiting plan. Ah, okay. Yep. That's a good answer. Good tight answer. What's this? You keep the high performing boards if you set clear expectations. So the higher the standard you set, the easier it is to know what you're looking for. Absolutely. Okay. People want to know what's expected of them, and they feel much better when they do. Okay, now there's an interesting twist here on this next slide about losing talent and influence to other organizations. What's that about? Well, I don't like to see myself as a stalker. Poaching, I, stalking, <laughs> yeah. how about a little polite term? Absolutely. Okay. But if I see a great board president or a great board member who's about to get term limited off, I'm going to call that person for coffee. Oh, my. Yeah, okay. because nice. if if I've seen they've done great work, I want them on my board. So give us a couple closing thoughts here in terms of uh, a board members, having them leave, whether by term limits or by choice. I mean, what, this has been a talk about term limits, but the reality is uh, the, the essence of uh, term limits is the board members and, and, and whether they're on the board or not. So what do you, what do you have here to close with? You can do three things that are really important because when someone leaves, you want them as a friend for life. You say thank you, you do an exit interview, and you really listen to them, and you determine how they want to stay connected. Okay. And so that's the way we keep friends for life and keep vibrant boards. Okay, any parting thoughts other than that on term limits? I, I think it's really a difficult situation when you've got great people who have to leave. And when you do, you have to find a great place for them that fits their personalities. And it's very difficult to be disciplined enough to, and the reason, one of the reasons for term limits is to continue to bring in fresh talent. Yeah, and of course that's the key is to have a strategy and a plan to bring in new talent all the time. So really, how do you keep the board refreshed? whether you have a, uh, onerous term limits or easy term limits or something in between. But the reality is when you do your strategy, when you're doing planning, while it may sound mundane, you always want to keep your eye on what you're doing and how you're handling term limits. Absolutely. Thanks That's so a wrap. Much. Thanks. Thank you again to Tom and Carol for your wonderful insight today. If you have any questions or comments for today's speakers, their contact information is on the screen. If you have interest in learning more about BoardPack, please send us an email, sales at boardpack.com.